I'm Patrick Sharkey. I'm professor of sociology at New York University. I just published uh, my book, which is called Uneasy Peace, The Great Crime Decline, The Renewal of City Life, and the Next War on Violence. The first question that I look at is what are the full consequences of violence? So looking beyond victims and perpetrators, looking at the full reach, who is affected by violence, how violence affects uh, kids throughout a community and how it affects different aspects of community life, like whether people are venturing out into public space, uh, whether business owners are setting up shop, how people are using public space, who invests in a community, those kind of questions. So most of my research, I, I use national data. So I gather data, as much data as I can from cities all across the country and try to understand how trends in violence that have taken place at different times in different places affect outcomes like uh, academic achievement, uh, the development of cognitive skills, economic mobility, and other dimensions of, of uh, social and economic success. What I've found in my work is that the impacts of violence are much stronger, I think, than anyone realized. So violence affects um, uh, kids' academic achievement, it affects their development of cognitive skills, um, it affects how far they advance uh, on, in the income distribution, that is, the degree to which they are upwardly mobile or, or not. So the, the consequences of violence are much broader than I think we realize, and, and they affect a whole bunch of different domains of, of social and economic life. The biggest change that I focus on in my book is the drop in violence that's taken place in most cities, almost every city across the country over the past 25 years. Uh, so in the nation as a whole, we've seen violence fall by about half, but then there are a bunch of major cities, New York being one, but lots of others, Los Angeles, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, San Francisco, lots of places where violence has fallen by 75% or more. So these are cities where uh, the very nature of the city has really transformed as they've gone from extremely dangerous places to extraordinarily safe places. So that's what I'm looking at in the country as a whole, and I'm kind of looking at what have the consequences been? How has, how has have different dimensions of inequality changed as violence has fallen? When violence falls, what we find is that uh, things like academic achievement improve. Kids start doing better in school. Racial gaps in academic achievement start to narrow, and then the effects linger on. So kids are more likely to move upward in the income distribution. Entire communities start to turn around. Life comes back to, to neighborhoods as violence falls, and really the nature of city life starts to change as public spaces start to fill up. People go back to the subways, as, as we've seen in New York, um, and it really changes the character of public spaces in cities. The most direct effect of the decline in violence has been that it's preserved tens of thousands of lives. And, and so what we did, and this was with a former student, Michael Friedson, is we actually mapped out what life expectancy at birth looks like for different groups in the US, and then what it would have looked like, looked like if violence had never fallen. So in other words, if the homicide rate had never changed from 1991 to the present, um, what would life expectancy look like for different groups? And, and the, the main finding from that analysis is that most groups aren't affected all that much because homicide is not a major cause of death uh, for most groups. But for African-American men, there's an enormous difference in life expectancy that's attributable to the drop in homicide. So essentially what we conclude is that the decline in, in homicide has led to about four-fifths of a year improvement in life expectancy for black men, which may not seem like much, but that is just an enormous change in life expectancy uh, that is comparable to any advancement in public health that's occurred over the past two decades. So the comparison that I like to make is to the obesity epidemic, um, which is this national phenomenon, gotten tons of attention and research, and uh, the people who have estimated how obesity affects life expectancy have, have concluded that if it were to disappear tomorrow, if there was no person in the United States who was overweight, we could expect life expectancy of the population to improve somewhere between a third of a year and a year. Um, and so what that means is that the effect of the drop in homicide mortality on life expectancy of black men is equivalent to or greater than the effect that we would see if obesity were eliminated altogether. That's the scale of change we're talking about. And so, you know, I really think of this as 
the most important public health advancement for black men that's taken place in the last several decades. And we usually don't think about it that way, but that's what it is. Yeah. So what I argue is that public spaces transformed in the early 1990s and they transformed in a lot of different ways, some of which were very positive, some of which were very negative. So we know that law enforcement expanded and became much more aggressive in the early 1990s. We know that the criminal justice system continued to expand in the 1990s, but then a whole set of other changes took place. Um, private security guards proliferated, uh, video surveillance uh, increased. And so these are all kind of uh, uh, troubling changes that took place. There was another change that has not received the same attention, and that is that the nonprofit sector exploded in the 1990s, which means that residents and local organizations mobilized to take back city streets and playgrounds and parks to provide services, after school programs, community centers, um, services for addiction, for reentry. And these patterns of change, this movement for change, has been largely left out of its discussions about why violence fell. Um, but what, what we find in the research is that this expansion of the nonprofit sector, particularly nonprofits focused on building stronger communities, on confronting violence, had an enormous impact and has to stand alongside those other changes as one of the most important factors that led to the drop in crime. There are two core conclusions uh, from the book. The first is that the greatest benefits of the crime drop have been experienced by the most disadvantaged segments of the population. But the second is that the methods that we typically rely on to confront violence, meaning intense surveillance, expansion of law enforcement, expansion of the criminal justice system, have had their greatest costs on the most disadvantaged segments of the population, okay? So when we acknowledge both the benefits of the crime drop and the costs of those methods, we're left with two core questions. And the first is, how do we extend the decline in violence so that it reaches every city and every neighborhood across the country? And secondly, how do we do so with a different model, a model that no longer relies as heavily on the police and the prison system to deal with violence? And you know, the, the positive aspect of this is that we have really strong evidence that if other actors are given the same commitment and the same resources, particularly if residents and local organizations are given the same commitment and the same resources, they can be extremely effective and, and actually much more effective uh, in confronting violence. So what I argue for in the book is a shift in a model that focuses on the idea of punishment as a response to violence toward a model that focuses on the idea of investment. Uh, and so that's investment in new forms of policing and in reforms of the criminal justice system. But more importantly, it's, a, it's investment in residents and community organizations who've always had the greatest capacity to control violence, but have never been given that same commitment.